Okay, good, good afternoon everybody. Um, um, good afternoon. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, this is in fact subliminal advertising for a brand of beer. Um, so, um, <laughs> essentially, uh, that, that's, uh, I have to leave this, uh, my sponsor has paid me to leave this here for another 20 seconds. So while I do so, um, what I'm going to do is to think a little bit about the entire process of doing the project. And I really believe this is something that has turned into a charade or a circus. But a charade or a circus with very, very serious economic consequences. Because what is happening is that we are using this uncertainty that is generated by, uh, uh, by our government. What, what it is doing is it is making us certain worse. And so I want to take you through the logic of the argument and then suggest uh, what, what might be done. So we can see it in two ways. I, I'm the sort of starter, and the starter is that there's some uncertainty ahead, and the main course is Eve, who's going to talk about austerity. And then the interplay between the two is simply that uncertainty amplifies the effects of austerity. So the whole idea is we know we're in trouble. We know that we have signed up to a program which says that we must cut our budget deficit. Okay, that's an international agreement. I'm going to take that as a given, and then Neve is going to examine it and problematize it a little bit more. But the point is, that's given. Our politicians can do nothing about that. But what they can do something about is uncertainty. In other words, at the moment, our processes are amplifying the effects of austerity and making people dreadfully unhappy. So just to give you an example, I have a very good friend. I went around to her house um, sometime in July. And she just read a newspaper article that child benefit was going to be cut. She has five children. On a pre-tax base with five children, that's about 15,000 euros a year being picked out of your pocket. Now, what, what will happen to that person? Well, I, I'll tell you what happens to me. She, she says, hey, we need to cut back on our summer holidays. We need to cut back on everything else. We're not going to buy a new car. You know, this is awful. And then I pick up the newspaper, this uh, Irish Independent today, and I'm told PAYE workers are going to get whacked for 3,000 euros. So, you know, you sort of see this coming at you every day, and my sense is that it leads to individual economic actors saying, yikes, I better save whatever money I can. I'm not going to go out and I'm not going to spend money on services or perhaps painting my living room or anything of that nature. So I want to focus very much on how we're amplifying and actually making austerity worse than it should be. Okay. Uh, this I look very fortuitously. I'm very interested in uh, something called balance sheet recession. So uh, this is largely uh, the, the, the case study is seen as Japan. And no doubt some of you have heard these phrases like a lost decade and things of that nature. And this pretty much, you know, it's very fortuitous. I was passing through Ranala on, um, on Monday morning and they just put up a sign outside Ranala Credit Union. We have money to lend. Come in and talk to us. And meanwhile, there's a number of underemployed economists standing around <laughs> outside. Okay. So, uh, but the beauty of this is that what, what, what it really does is it gets to this notion of a balance sheet recession because if you look at the Japanese experience, what it means is that economic logic gets turned on its head. In other words, it's not a case of there's loads of people banging down the door to borrow money from banks. It's a case of nobody wants to borrow. The future has become so uncertain that people cease to act in the way that economic theory would predict and instead they sort of go, how am I going to pay down my debt? You know, the notion five years ago that a credit union would have to put a large poster outside, presumably without planning permission, uh, put a large poster outside saying, come borrow money from us, sort of speaks to the sort of problem we have. And meanwhile, while this credit union is going out saying, we want to lend money to you, we have five taxi drivers here who are completely underemployed because everybody's saying, I'm going to ride a bicycle to save money. So, you know, this, this is the problem of a recession, that if you have uncertainty at this level, you're back to pictures that almost look like the 1930s. Um, and then, what's the nature of the austerity? Well, I think, you know, it's very why, you know, people speak about, oh, we need a correction to our fiscal problems and whatnot. But just to sort of put this out in, in, in bold type, um, the amount of the correction, and bear in mind, at the end of 
this process, we will not have a balanced budget. There will still be a 3% deficit. So in order to get to 3% deficit, you know, in other words, to get to a stage where we're still mortgaging future generations of this country, it's 10 and a half billion. And that's the amount over the next three years. And so working that out in terms of individuals, we could say, well, for every person in the country that's aged 20 to 65, that amounts to paying off 3,500. And if you look just at people who pay taxes, it moves up to about 5,000. And then per household, about 7,000. But the key point is, this is every year. So you get this idea, oh well, it's a 3 billion cut. But this is a permanent 3 billion cut. So the idea is that really what austerity means is that on the average, every household in the country is going to get taken for 7,150. And that will simply be to get us down to a level of, you know, a 3% government deficit or whatever. So this is pretty serious stuff. So serious that I have some investment advice. Buy early in the shares. Okay? Because ultimately, this is pretty serious stuff. This is 7,000 from every household in the country every year for the foreseeable future, unless the economy begins to grow again. So without economic growth, this is basically the future that one is looking at. Um, so, and it gets worse, because when the stakes are high, lobbying becomes lucrative. Okay, so um, what you find is, supposing somebody is fighting a court case, where they stand a chance of winning a million dollars. Okay, so they stand a chance in the court case of winning a million dollars. Uh, but the probability of success is very low. Generally what they will do, they are the people who go out and hire expert witnesses. Because they also basically go, well, I only need to pay 3,000 to an expert witness, and in return I might be win a million. So people sort of view it like a lottery. And the problem here is that lobbying is probably quite neutral. Okay, in other words, the stakes are so high, everybody knows at the end of the day that on the average it's 7,000 euros per household. So the whole trick is, can you invest in lobbyists to defend your position? So, for example, you know, uh, it is it worth going out and getting somebody to, to further your position? But then the problem is, if lobbying is perceived to be successful, everybody else goes, oh my God, I'm going to have to pay double. Okay, so let's think a little bit about it. Supposing the government goes along and says, we're going to tax septic tanks. And then, subsequently, they back down. They say, well, we're going to tax septic tanks, but the tax will be five euros a year. Okay. Now, what does that say? Well, to me, a person who does not own a septic tank, uh, though I am considering one, but I, I don't own a septic tank, I'm going to say, well, if they're not paying for their septic tanks, that means that I'm going to have to pay more. But the problem is, if there's lobbying, if there's uncertainty, everybody in the country believes that they're going to get whacked worse than everybody else. And so part of the problem of uncertainty, I believe, today in this country, is that probably, despite the fact we know the check is going to be for 7,000, everybody believes and conjectures that somebody else will be successful at lobbying. So that in turn means everybody believes that it's going to cost me 15,000 a year, not 7,000 a year. And so that's what I mean by a fallacy of composition. That the uncertainty leads to people behaving as if Rather than having to sign a check for 7,000, they will have to sign a check for 50. And if everybody believes that, that means that consumption and investment and people sort of going out and saying, will I create jobs for people? Will I use a taxi today in order to create employment for somebody else? People say, no, I'm not going to do that because I'm going to get taken for 15,000. Now, so far you may say, well, oh, gee, you know, this, you know, this says nothing. So, what I thought was, well, would it be interesting if we could measure uncertainty? So, um, there, there are a number of economists in the US at Chicago and Stanford who've developed an uncertainty measure which is based on newspaper reports. Okay, In other words, how many newspaper reports are there on uncertainty this month? And they found that this is an incredibly good indicator of economic activity. In other words, that if uncertainty is being mentioned a lot in the press, that in turn leads to people saying, I'm not going to hire new workers, I'm not going to invest in new assets, and I'm going to cut consumption. And they found this is a good lead indicator. So what I thought I'd do is to replicate this for Ireland. And I went along and I sort of 
obviously, for, you know, got my little computer to go through all the newspapers. Uh, sorry, just the Irish Times because there is no other Irish newspaper. <laughs> uh, so uh, I, I basically went along. If, if we use the independent, this index would sort of go right up to the ceiling. So you know, this is a moderate sort of view uh, of events. So this goes from 2000 to 2011. Okay. And, you know, the logic, and this ties up with, say, the US data, you get sort of spikes around the time of 9-11, also around the first, sorry, the second Gulf War, you know, so things spiked up, and then everything went really calm, so this was the period where we had our real estate bubble, everybody feels confident that the country's population is going to double, and this is the time to jump on the property ladder, so you can see the uncertainty is very low, and everybody's going out over-investing. And then what happens? Well, number one, we get 2008. There's this little bank called Anglo that got into a little difficulty and was uh, given a government guarantee. So we can see September, October 2008, this index begins to spike up. And then it sort of calms down. We can still see uncertainty is quite high. And then this point here is where the IMF come in. So this is the point where, I, I don't know if this happened to you, where you just go to a bar and you meet somebody and say, have you noticed you don't get 50 euro notes out of the ATMs anymore? Or have you noticed that this is a German 50 euro note, it's not an Irish 50 euro note? And you know, so this was the time when everybody thought, gosh, things are going to get quite horrible indeed. So you can see uncertainty spiked up again, and then we had a subsequent budget in December 2010. And, and then everything goes, pretty quiet until we start coming up to the budget last year. And you can see that the mere process of saying that we're going to have a budget in three months' time, where we're going to take three billion from the population, okay? we're going to have this budget in three months' time, and you can see it's almost as, as effective in terms of uncertainty as having a bank go bust and a government guarantee. So in other words, the process, the budgetary process, is actually generating uncertainty. And if the US research is believed, what does this lead to? Well, it leads between 9 and 24 months to about a 4% fall in economic activity. So in other words, this, what's happening with uncertainty is that it's amplifying this process of getting the government's deficit back into a, a sensible position. So for that reason, I think one needs to carefully consider uncertainty. And why should one consider it? Well, the thing is that uncertainty is something that can be managed. Okay? Whereas the austerity is largely signed up to, so there's very little a local government can do about this, uh, apart from you know, engaging in, in, in good foreign affairs. But um, you know, the, the trick here is that this is something that the government could manage, and I believe, should manage. Because what's going on is that essentially we have austerity, we know about that. We know austerity will lead to less investment, less consumption, less jobs, lower growth, and that it could become a sort of perpetual cycle. But then that's going to be amplified by uncertainty. And so the more a government can do to, to lower the level of uncertainty, to lower the amplification of this austerity, the better. And so that would get me to some policy implications. First thing is that if you want to reduce uncertainty, uh, it would be good to disclose the entire schedule of all the cuts and tax increases that will take place over the next three years immediately. And why do I say that? Well, let's just think. We're, we're a small institution here. We have the president of our institution sitting here. And what's the difficulty if you're running a university? Well, the difficulty is you do not know how much money you will have next year. Universities are a long-term investment business. They involve hiring long, hiring faculty potentially for many years to come, and then having very uncertain income streams to pay for those faculty. So the, the problem is, without any certainty, you can't plan in advance. So the whole trick is that by revealing all immediately, it would allow individual agents to plan. And that's much better than allowing individual agents to speculate. Because if everybody is speculating, that they're going to get whacked for 15,000 euros, it means you just kill economic activity completely. Then the next bit is to sort of come clean and say, and this will involve proactive changes to pension and redundancy law. So let's just think about this. At the moment, I, I was contacted by one semi-state body, 
uh, some time ago. They said, well, you know, we're, we're, we're thinking of, um, you know, sort of scaling back, you know, restructuring our operations, lowering headcount within, within this agency. Okay. And I said, well, very good. And they said, our only problem is that we need to borrow a whole heap of money to make all those redundancy payments now. In other words, we're going to sh save money in the future, we're going to save money for the exchequer, but the problem is that we need to borrow a whole whack of cash now to deal with all of these redundancy items and pension items. And because we're having difficulties borrowing money, we can't restructure. So, the, uh, so there are you know, things that can be done in terms of things like pension and redundancy law proactively that would assist this process. I think the next trick is, and this is where I think the government is in some difficulty, is that it must demonstrate some resolve. Okay, so uh, at the end of the day, given that everybody has an incentive to lobby, if the government doesn't show resolve, it means that people will come back and lobby more vigorously. So my sense is, in the absence of resolve, uh, this is probably not such a good thing. Um, and the next bit, uh, and something that has worried me, is that at the moment, we generate opportunities for all sorts of chancers to go on public television, to go on public radio, and to appear in newspapers with half-baked ideas that somehow, if you look after us, everything else will be all right. So I, I think there's a real case for sort of saying that you should have asked all interest groups, given that they want special treatment, who deserves to not get special treatment? In other words, we can't all be special. So somebody somewhere has to take the hit. And then finally, I think, you know, what we can do with all of this is to move public debate a little bit. Instead of saying, you know, how, who, who's going to take the hit, who's going to get whacked in terms of the 7,000 euros, to actually ask also about when the economy returns to growth, and if it returns to growth, and this is all sort of interdependent, but by returning to growth, once we return to growth, who will get a share? In other words, if a certain group is going to have to do badly today, it's possible to say, well, in the future, should growth resume, that group will be looked after first. And so perhaps moving the argument on a little bit into uh, ex ante, in other words, how do you share things before they happen, might be a good thing. And so in conclusion, uh, one hopes that one isn't going to be seeing this sign too often, but nevertheless, they've actually changed it to the gathering, but the less said about that, the better. Okay? Uh, but the whole trick is that government can do something. Okay? Austerity, its hands are tied. But in terms of reducing uncertainty and the consequences of uncertainty, which are people not spending money, people not hiring new workers, and people not engaging in investment, that that is something that can be managed and should be managed. Thank you for your attention.